So a couple of days ago, uh, Howard Megdahl in the Sports Illustrated uh, had a long form article. The peg of it, of course, was the Brittany Griner situation, but more specifically to you, it was talking about the continued growth of the WNBA and how things are changing and maybe changing rapidly and changing more in the future. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was talking about the TV deal, which the WNBA currently only gets about $25 million for their TV rights, which is far below market value. They're trying to get $100 million in their next deal that's coming up in 2024. Uh, mm -hmm. They were also talking about a $75 million equity sale that allowed a lot of the players to take advantage of that. They're trying to get the maximum salary of the WNBA up above $500,000. Now, I know in the WNBA, you wouldn't be a max salary type of player, but rising water, all boats go up with it. Um, mm -hmm. And everybody would benefit from an increased investment from all avenues. Um, mm -hmm. We talked about how you got drafted in the second round. If there was a bigger WNBA, it is quite possible you would not have gone overseas. You would have stayed in the United States, continued to play for another team. Mm -hmm. um, what does this increased investment, do you think, mean for players like you who are a high-level basketball player playing in the high-level Spanish league previously, now in Sweden? You said you didn't want to play competitively. There are probably you know, a lot of players that might. What do you think that means for players and women in terms of their playing overseas versus staying home and being able to stay more? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, the WNBA has grown exponentially and at a super high rate. It's just, it needs to happen quicker and needs more funding and more platforms to be exposed mm -hmm. on. With them growing the game, it does provide more opportunities for people like me or those a little bit more talented that can stay home and can play um, opens up a ton of jobs overseas now I did say I wasn't sure what I wanted but there is that competitor in me that always wants to play at the highest level right so those Euro Cup Euro League high level top couple teams in each country those become more available for the rest of us mm -hmm. um, when I was drafted don't quote me on this but I think rookie minimum was like 42 um, now over a course of a May, June, July, August, September, plus playoffs, that's pretty good ratio, but 42 is also a teacher salary. Mm -hmm. And I went to school and did my undergrad in education and I would have been better off being a teacher. Right. Financially. <laughs> um, yeah. Financially. Yep. With benefits and all of those things. Um, I would love to see the increased <laughs> wages in women's sports, um, Man, I know, I know the game is growing, but I just, it's hard when the league passes like $90. I think we talked about that. You spend more on your Netflix or Spotify subscription. And, um, and you're not even getting all the games, as you mentioned. And you're not, no, and they're not accessible to you. So I understand that $90 is a sliver to pay in order to support the women's um, league. But at the same time, like you want fans, you want viewers, and it needs to be accessible in my opinion. Um, and obviously like it's shown to be a good, I don't know what you, if you even want to call it investment that like it, it does profit. You look at the women's NCAA tournament this year and the pay, like the attendance was crazy and the viewership is up exponentially. And so it's one of those that you need to keep finding people that are going to invest in it. And I think the league is just going to continue to return that. But yeah, I mean, it's super like in my eyes, there's no downside, you know, more investment, more job opportunities and more job opportunities overseas. And it also provides more players that are hopeful of playing overseas the opportunities as well so i don't necessarily think there's a downside <laughs> yeah and, and and well you know expanded investment it's hard to find a downside in that but one of the things yeah. the article also mentioned as you mentioned as well that there would be more opportunities for players like you overseas because the most elite players the top 10 percent mm -hmm. who play in things like euro league and the spanish league mm -hmm. would be staying home uh yeah. in the you know so they would get the opportunity you would have an opportunity to get more playing time more money you would be a more elite player in those leagues yeah. um and the top one percent would stay home so there would be less wear and tear on their bodies so it would be better for the mm -hmm. league as a whole because they're able to to play at a higher level in the wnba because they're healthier playing a shorter amount of time well, 
then you, I was going to say, instead of a five month season, you could have a NBA or maybe have a little bit better travel so that their bodies aren't breaking down. Or, right. I mean, all these things are these little steps that have to be reached in order to actually like hit that level that they want. But that's a lot of games fit into a little season and oh, the, sure. the travel's awful on their bodies. And, you know, mm-hmm. I'm sure you were aware of that article, the New York Liberty got fined mm-hmm. for taking a charter flight because the league doesn't allow it. Like, and there was, like a, there was like a, a, a consideration of a much more severe punishment than the fine they received yes. too. Yeah. Um, so that was, yeah. that was a huge issue because, yeah. and, and I'm, I, I know that there is a lot of issue with, with parity and revenue sharing and all that mm-hmm. stuff in a league that, yeah. as I talked about, they're only making $25 million off of TV money. Mm-hmm. Expand that, you know, that's another thing that you talked about where they mm-hmm. don't have to worry about being fine for allowing their yeah. players to have better comfort. Um, yeah. So it, it, there's just a lot, a lot going on. Yeah. There's a lot more. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. When you're in the, when you're in the heart of when you're actually like in those WNBA where they don't even have their own facilities and they don't have, you know, it's like, you have to make sure that life and basketball is good within the 12 you have. I, I mm-hmm. think too, before you actually work on expanding and, you know, you don't want it too spread out I would imagine you know there's still so many things within the league that can get better and I feel like you want to establish a good ground level before you expand too much I would think and and that too like you don't want to expand too much obviously but like players like that we've interviewed like Promise Mucamera and Natalie Butler Mm -hmm. and you having an opportunity in the WNBA they were all like if the league had another team or two maybe we'd still be around you Mm -hmm. know who knows? Absolutely. Like that, yeah. that's another thing, another opportunity to have so they can play closer to home and, and, and be more comfortable and, and all that. So that's another factor in this continued, um, uh, continued uh, investment into the league. But the, the bottom line is this, is as far as I viewed it, um, and feel free to follow up with this as well. It's time for, to, to get this, to get the ball rolling on this. You know, the league's been around for 20, 25 years now. Uh, had some financial difficulties after the first initial segment. Uh, some teams that were successful originally no longer in the league uh, mm-hmm. because they had financial difficulties as well. But the kid gloves have come, got to come off for the WNBA now for this to be successful long term. Like you can't stick around the point that they are anymore and have an mm-hmm. expectation that they're going to be an elite league uh, in terms mm-hmm. of the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, investing in it is crucial the TV exposure is crucial and it, <laughs> it's easy to say what's needed to be done. But I mean, at the end of the day, it has to be done. And until that is, it's just going to keep, you know, it's going to keep, keep increasing, but not at the level or at the pace that they want. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But a- any expansion is good expansion and yeah. having better you know, business is going to help us for sure. It's hard to, because I, I think, I don't know if we've touched on this, but player turnover is so low. Hmm. You know, you have your vets on your team that are occupying four or five, six of the 12 spots. How old is Super you know? now? Like 42 years old? Yeah. And it's amazing. Like you can't, you can't blame them for, no, you know, of not. working and I'd play as long as I could too. But I remember with the Mystics, we had like four or five vets that were at the last, like at the tail end of their career. And I remember thinking like, well obviously they have the credibility and having bets in the locker room is super important don't get me wrong but in a league where there's hardly any turnover you like you take those 12 teams cut them in half and now you've got 12 teams of six players and what if my math is correct what that's 72 spots available Mm -hmm. and you draft 36 players a year like the numbers just don't add up they don't and that's why you end up with second rounders like you that that wash out of the league that wouldn't have otherwise Mm -hmm. Exactly. And thank goodness that there's overseas basketball because there's not even a G league. There's not anything like that here. Mm -hmm. And so it's the second best thing and it does afford us to see the world while we're at it and have all these cool experiences, but why not be able to do both? (laughs) There's first rounders that are getting cut quickly. Like it's not even just one name that I can drop. There's multiples. Like that's Mm -hmm. crazy. It's not because they're busts and they just aren't in a good fit and there aren't that many spots. I think that's yeah. that's pretty much it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's interesting because 
it happens year after year after year. And I have to admit that before I was educated in it, I didn't even realize it. And before I was thrown into it, you don't realize the actual like reality of it, but you take one or two big name players that get cut. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. And it's like, no, this has been happening for years and years and years, but it's, it's almost nice that people like, I forgot. There was one example I remember where it was like the number four pick got waved immediately and everyone was up in arms. Cause I think that she had a big social media presence and whatnot, but it's like, I'm almost thankful that happened not to her. Cause I think it's awful. And I want everyone to succeed, but like, it's good you see the reality of what's happening in this league. And it sucks that it comes at her expense. But I remember when I got cut, everyone was like, well, didn't you get drafted 27th? Like that should have been guaranteed money. And I'm like, well, no, you would think, but no, that's not accurate at all. Like, yeah, should have been, they're not wrong, but it's yeah, not. You, you, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's tough with that. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Hopefully and people, continue to invest and watch and that's the only thing that you can do is promote and watch at this point but and and look i've I've talked about this before too the general i've been watching women's college basketball since the the 90s Mm -hmm. Um, when i started watching sports i did watch a lot of that Uh, my wife Mm -hmm. is a yukon women's basketball fan she's from connecticut so you know i've been aware of the the Connecticut basketball and back when they were a big rival with Tennessee in the late nineties. Mm-hmm. So I've been watching it for a good while. Uh, the mm-hmm. quality of basketball has always been there, but it's still rising. Um, mm-hmm. Connecticut. And it's, it's clear that Connecticut is still a very good team. They are no longer the dominant team that's going to go undefeated Which and win the title. Awesome for women's college yes. basketball. Yes. <laughs> Schools like South Carolina stepping up and all yeah. that. It's, it's great. Yeah. It's great. It's wonderful. Oh, yeah. Again, rising tide lifts all boats. But at the same time, when you're stuck in a TV deal that was made in 1997, mm-hmm. when there weren't the 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 highest level talent wasn't quite as deep as it is today. You know, that's mm-hmm. it's it, it's time. It's time. Yeah. You know, it's time to get out of that. It's time to move on. It's not the 90s. It's not the aughts anymore. We're in the 2020s. No, absolutely. I think that's a great time, to, great thing to end it on, though, is that it's time. <laughs> it's time. Yeah. Hello, and thanks for watching. Be sure to give the video a like, and you can watch more videos over here. Uh, you can also click subscribe over here so you're notified when we have new content here on Expat Hoops.